Good morning. Welcome to Kimball on this beautiful Sunday morning. We are excited you're here for worship today. Please stand and join us in singing. We have two songs back to back, A New Hallelujah and Mighty to Save. a new song breaking out from the children of freedom every race and every nation sing it out sing a new hallelujah let us sing love to the nations bringing hope of the grace that has freed us make it strong
Well, as, as Andy Griffith would say, that was extra good. That was extra good. You all did well. Here it is, the Sunday after Easter, and we're not supposed to have anybody here. We've got a good crowd, and you all were singing. A lot of you are singing Billy Joel songs, but that's okay, I know. Uh, no, but I would like to be a big shot up here. <laughs> So um, we're, we're glad that you're here and especially impressed with those of you who went to a concert or went on vacation last week, did all kinds of fun and exciting things. I always like to look at Facebook and feel, you know, sort of like I don't do anything in life. But uh, I know y'all were out having a good time and I'm glad you're back here in worship. And it's always dangerous, isn't it, to mention somebody who's in church because you say, well, you know, my Aunt Gladys was in church and you didn't mention her. But this is the first time since the pandemic that Sudi Foyle has been here. And we are so grateful to have you here along with your daughter from Pennsylvania. And um, we are going to be dedicating this beautiful funeral pall uh, uh, during this uh, welcome time. And... Larry Harris said, I think it would be good if um, Howard Bentley and I came up and lifted the pole up so everyone could see how beautiful it is. And I said, oh, that's ridiculous. We don't need to do that. Everybody can see. And then I thought, no, Larry once again is right. We need to have you all do that. So not right now, but during the time of the blessing, we will do that. Right now, we're going to ask Donna Taylor to come up with our council communicator and tell us what's going on in the life of the church. Good morning. I'd like to share with you a few things that uh, was discussed at your church council meeting on Thursday evening. Number one, the lights have been replaced in the narthex and the hall on the second floor of the educational building, which is right out here. Many thanks to Rick Toomer and the volunteers that helped spread the mulch on April 9th. The executive team recommended and approved by finance and the church council the painting of the halls and the exterior doors on the first floor of the educational building as well as the kitchen. The council also approved the creation of a columbarium committee to discuss the feasibility of a columbarium at Kimball. The chairperson is Eric Jones 
and the members are Mark At Mike Abernathy, Karen Whitley, Bob Boynton, and Betsy Smith. Thanks to the members of the Joe Gribble class for cleaning and organizing the kitchen. The chairs and the commons have been professionally cleaned as we plan our celebration of the debt retirement with a meal on May 1st, which is next sun Sunday. Please sign up to attend as we celebrate the total elimination of our debt after 19 years. At the request of council, Bob Hill is reviewing the Hoke Ritchie property. He will be making a recommendation to the council the value of the property versus the value of the tax, the, excuse me, the property value versus the tax value and how we should proceed in the best interest of the church. Thanks to the Lutheran men for preparing a delicious breakfast on Easter morning. Pastor John is still talking about how good it was. There are 14, yes, 14 fourth and fifth grade children from Carver Elementary School that will be attending Luther Ridge this summer. And Jody Hott will be the care person for them. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Jody. <clears throat> Lastly, there's going to be a sign up for training of the AED device that will begin the week of May 8th. Lots of good things happening here at Kimball. Thank you and God's peace. Thank you so much, Donna. And uh, when, when we heard that we had 14 kids from Carver going and that Jody was in charge, she got a little twitch. <laughs> but we're glad that you're, yes, it's the biggest group we've ever taken. We're glad you're going to uh, be with them and uh, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> no, we'll be at Luther Ridge the week before, so it'll be a, it'll be a good time. Um, I did want to reiterate what Donna said about the meal. We are trying to get our numbers locked down. We don't want to not have enough food. That would be a tragedy. And we also don't want to have too many meals. And uh, so you're signing up either on the website uh, with Sign Up Genius or using the insert in the bulletin today is really important. So thank you for doing that. I uh, think at this point, is there anything else I need to talk about? The youth are going to uh, uh, play laser tag today, so we're excited about all of that. And I think that's it. So at this point, I'm going to uh, dedicate this beautiful funeral pall, which Sudi Foyle has given to the church to the glory of God. And uh, Sudi, we know that you have been a member here for many, many years. And this is just one more expression of the love and the support that you have for our congregation. So I'm going to do the dedication service, and then I'll ask Larry and Howard to come forward and to lift it up so that we can see how beautiful it really is. Of course, I've got the wrong page. Let us stand together. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have enriched our lives with every good and perfect gift. You have commanded us to show your splendor to our children and to praise you with lives of love, justice, and joy. Accept now this funeral, Paul, which we offer in thanksgiving. May it be a reminder that in baptism we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that we may know that those who have departed this earthly life are received into the arms of your mercy. Bring us at length to your perfect kingdom where you live and reign with the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And so, Howard and Larry, I'll let you come and open this up so that uh, the congregation can see what a beautiful liturgical garment this is.
it is just beautiful and uh, will be a welcome addition to our worship life and will be used with much love and with much joy. Thank you. As they are getting things back together, you can read the bulletin. You can see that both of our services will be changing a little bit beginning today. And so I'll be honest with you, I'm going to have to pay particular attention to everything that we're doing this morning so that I'll be right on uh, target. So we will continue this service now with the prayer of the day. We'll let you all get that. They'll have wonderful things to say about their pastor as they get back to their seats saying, yeah, yeah, that's right. Don't bother thanking me. And so now let us pray. O oh God of life, you reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of your risen son. By your spirit's breath, Revive our faith in your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. To me. TJ, come talk to me. Come on, buddy. He's like, you don't call me out, Miss Liz. <coughs> All right, friends. Come sit with me, Lucy. This morning, Lucy was in the nursery, and I got her to say, hey, Lucy, say, I, say, I love Miss Liz. Lucy, can you say, I love Miss Liz? She said it this morning because Pastor John was sitting there, and uh, she said, Miss Liz is my favorite. Uh, she, uh, we were talking about the animals, weren't we, Lucy? All right, friends, who do you think we're going to talk about today? We are going to talk about Jesus today. We're going to talk about Jesus. So, question, have you ever been hurt before? Yeah? Yeah, you've been hurt before too? Like, like how? Tell me. Yep. Like you also be a hurt where like there's like words that make you feel sad. You are correct. Words that make you feel sad. There are two ways Charlie said to be um, to be hurt, and that is you can fall, skin your knee, or you can be you can words hurt sometimes. Good job, Alex Story. Uh uh uh. That's great. Well, today, you know, last week we celebrated Easter. Do you remember, did we sing the song? Do you remember the song? Lent was purple, right? Purple. It was, we talked about ministry and Jesus' journey to the cross. And then Easter is gold, 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 gold. Jesus is risen, alleluia. So Jesus was raised from the dead. And, you know, he went to the disciples. Okay, so what do you think, what do you think was the first thing the disciples noticed about Jesus when he came back? He had been on the cross, right? He had been on the cross. Do you, do you know how he got on the cross? Like they put nails in his wrist and in his feet and a spear in his side. And so, of course, when Jesus comes back, he still has those wounds, right? So today, Pastor John is going to read to us out of the Gospel of, I think, St. John? Yeah. I didn't look at that first. Yes, the Gospel of John. And he's going to read to us all about how Jesus appears to only 11 of the disciples. One was missing, and it was my favorite disciple, Thomas. 
So Thomas is missing, and so then all his buddies go, and they say, Jesus is alive. What do you think Thomas said? Thomas is like, I don't know about this. I'm not so sure. I have to see the wounds in his hands and the scars in his feet before I will believe. And so then Jesus appears to all 12 of the disciples and Thomas is there. And of course, Jesus goes up to Thomas and he says to Thomas, he said, feel my wounds. They're real. And he said, Thomas, he said, do you have to see to believe? So we believe in Jesus because we know Jesus is in our hearts. And we know that we have faith, right? And so Jesus is with us every time we are wounded. Whether we're wounded by words or we fall off our bikes, Jesus is always with us because he goes with us in, in our hearts. And we don't necessarily have to see. We believe, right? And so that's really what Thomas, that's what Jesus tells Thomas today. He says, Thomas, he says, are, do you have to see it to believe it? Sometimes I have to see it to believe it, so I'm okay. But he said, do you have to see it to believe it? He said, blessed are those, blessed are those who believe yet do not see. So do you know who he's talking about? Thomas? He's talking about us. Oh. We don't have to see to believe. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. We know he was crucified. And we know he rose, he rose again. And who did he rise again for? Us. Us. Everybody, right? He did. He rose again for everybody. And so we can remember in this day and in this week, we can remember that Jesus always goes with us because Jesus is in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit leads and guides us. So we don't really have to see to believe. We just know that we believe. He's with us always, no matter what. And God gives us grace because there's grace for that. Can you remember that? All right. Can you all remember that? Okay. Let's pray. The Lord be with you. Dear, good, and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for all that you give us, but especially your Son, Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks for him appearing, but we also give you thanks for everyone who believes yet does not see. Lord, we give you thanks this day for this day and all days, and we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Here, Lucy, you want some crayons? Yeah. All right. TJ, you want some crayons? I'll bring it to you. All right. You ready? Okay, let me turn my mic off so I, you know. The reading this morning is from Acts chapter 5. Peter has been arrested for proclaiming the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. His response to the charges of the high priest summarizes the early church's proclamation of forgiveness of sin through repentance. Now for the reading from Acts. When they had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Word of God, word of life. Be Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter, and we say together, 
Glory to you, O Lord. The unprecedented events of the day of the resurrection continue as the risen Jesus appears to his fearful disciples. A week later, after Thomas worships Jesus, Jesus pronounces that the blessings of the resurrection are also for those who have not seen and yet believe. Now for the reading from John's Gospel. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord, and we say together, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. This is one of those lessons that we have every year. The folks who put together the lectionary feel that this story is so important that it needs to be told on a yearly basis. And so every year on the Sunday after Easter Sunday, the second Sunday of the Easter season, this is the lesson that makes up our gospel reading. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he showed them his hands and his side. We are now just one Sunday after Easter. It has been a beautiful week here in the Piedmont and still that glow from last Sunday when we had 250 people in worship is with us. The crowds, the flowers, the breakfast, the beautiful day. Easter seems to set right all that seems so wrong. Death and evil and injustice. Easter says to us in a powerful way that God's good purposes will not be defeated. That in the resurrection of Jesus, God has won out. In today's gospel, you remember the story that Jesus slips through the closed doors and appears before his despondent disciples. But it's interesting that at the beginning they don't know who he is. He speaks to them just as he had spoken to them so many times. He says, peace be with you, but still they don't recognize him. And then John says, he showed them his hands, and he showed them his side. He showed them, as Liz told the children, he showed them his wounds. 
And only then did they know him. And only then did they rejoice. Thomas shows up a little later. A lot of biblical and scholarly ink has been spilled on wondering where Thomas would have been during this time. No deep theological thinking. I always figured maybe he was at a ball game eating a hot dog or something like that, just needing to recuperate from all the events. What we do know is that he wasn't with the other disciples for the Easter appearance. And they tell him about the risen Christ, but he says, Look, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Anybody who thinks that Christianity is only a spiritual religion and is not so concerned with the body or the flesh or this life only needs to read this passage from John's Gospel. It's a very earthy text. A week later, today, as a matter of fact, the risen Christ again surprises the disciples and this time Thomas is there and Jesus obliges him. Put your finger here, Jesus says. Do not doubt, but believe. <clears throat> and so I want you to see that in some way there is a connection being made between seeing Jesus and recognizing Jesus and also seeing his wounds. Liz put it well when she talked to the children this morning. The reason Jesus had scars, it was not some pristine, perfected body. It's a different body, obviously, because Jesus can show up in rooms where doors are locked, but it is a physical body. Being raised from the dead did not erase the wounds that were made on Good Friday. Jesus' disciples recognized him as risen <clears throat> and as living only by seeing his scars. I think that's a very significant point. Easter, <clears throat> that glorious day, that stunning victory of God over sin, death, and the devil, Easter does not erase our wounds. <clears throat> I know a person who is a Christian, a very strong Christian, and somewhere along the way someone who I'm sure was well-meaning told her, if you are a Christian, that is if you are a real Christian, you will always feel joy and peace in your heart. It's ridiculous. This dear woman has had a hard life. She grew up with parents who were alcoholic. She doesn't always feel happy. Often, she experiences great sadness. Is there something wrong with her? Is her faith not yet firm and secure? Well, of course it is. Her faith has brought her much joy, even in the midst of her pain. But she still bears some wounds. And today is a good thing to remember that Jesus does as well. <clears throat> In seminary, we learned about a heresy. I know that you all are so interested in first century Christian heresies. Uh, but this heresy is, and, and just to make sure, everybody knows what a heresy is, right? A heresy is an untruth. It is something that sounds like it could be true about our faith, but in, in, in fact is not only false, but is false and can be dangerous. <clears throat> we learned about a 
heresy called docetism. It's from the Greek dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. This heresy says that Christ, the Son of God, did not really suffer on the cross, was not really a human being, did not truly die a physical death. Jesus only seemed to be human. Jesus only appeared to be human. And 2,000 years ago, the church in her wisdom said, no, that is false. Yes, Jesus was truly God, fully God. But Jesus is also fully human, which means he sweat and he laughed and he cried and he hurt and he bled and he was afraid and he died. The church said, only a wounded God, how profound is this? Only a wounded God can hear us and understand us. There's no other faith in the world that it makes that kind of a audacious claim. Only a wounded God can understand us. The Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2 goes so far as to say, by his wounds we have been healed. And so to be human is to bear wounds. We all have them. <clears throat> I have another <clears throat> I have another good friend, very successful, in, in his mid-80s now, lives in a beautiful home in a nice neighborhood. He spent much of his life at an orphanage. His mother took him there as a little boy, led him out of the car under a big maple tree, and told him she would be back later that afternoon to get him. And she never came back. As I said, my friend is now in his mid-80s. I know this is going to be a surprise. I was supposed to meet him for lunch one day, and I was running a tad late. <clears throat> I never do that. Actually, I was, I was only 15 minutes late, which is pretty good for me. And when I got to the restaurant, I found him in a state of high agitation pacing about, visibly upset, and very angry at me. And it seemed to me to be an overreaction to being 15 minutes late for a casual lunch. And he said, look, I can't help it. I know why I get so bent out of shape when a friend is late. My mother kept me waiting under that tree at the orphanage all my life. She never came back. And I cannot stand for someone that I care about to be late. This man is so successful. He's all grown up. He's in his mid-80s. He functions well in life. He has <clears throat> children and grandchildren. But he is still wounded. And he has a God who understands. And the risen Christ, the Christ after Easter, is still wounded. You know, there are people who think that Easter has overcome all that pain and all that suffering, that just because Jesus was raised from the dead, the cross is overcome, the cross is forgotten. 
that's why seriously there are a number of churches, more and more churches in fact, whose worship space has no cross. The cross is seen as a downer. The cross is seen as something that is negative. The cross is seen as something that has been overcome by the resurrection of Easter. That's not what Christianity says. Our faith offers us a Jesus who has nail prints in his hands. The Bible says that's the only way the twelve really knew him. They touched the scars and they believed. And so our Christian faith does not deny this pain. It does not deny the reality of the wounds of life, the fear, the sickness, the loneliness, the brokenness of life. Look, I'm like you. After two years of dealing with this pandemic, I'm ready to be done with it. And just when we think we're coming out, we have all this other to deal with that we never anticipated. You can't pretend that away. But what you can do is face it with courage and with confidence and with hope and with the knowledge that Jesus really is in our hearts and that it's going to be okay. I can promise you this. You and I cannot be helped by someone who doesn't understand. Christianity claims that God feels our pain because our God felt pain. He is no pretend God who got patched up and made whole. He comes to us with scars of his own. It is this wounded healer who has called you here today your Savior, the risen one. And if you don't know him yet, if you don't know him like Thomas, if you aren't sure that you believe, our Lord will graciously show you his hands that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. That is good news. It's the best news, and it's the only good news that we need. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us remain standing now for the thanksgiving for baptism. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the waters of baptism we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ. And we are a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for your river of life flowing freely from your throne, through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these baptismal waters, you flood us with mercy and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts. Wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. With the people of God in Christ now and in every time, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. You're invited to kneel or be seated as able for the prayers. <clears throat> Holy God, we ask that you would equip your church to be witnesses of your goodness, to go and tell others of your abundant love, that they may believe that Jesus is our salvation and our hope. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Direct those who are given human authority to lead with humility and compassion. By your Holy Spirit, channel their attention towards serving those who are most in need. We pray especially this day for the people of Ukraine and Eastern Europe and ask that your spirit of love and spirit of hope might touch the leaders of those nations so that your warring children may beat their swords into plowshares and practice war no more. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold your children who cry out to you. Wherever people are overcome by the fear of death, breathe into them your life and your peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the words of your saints who, like Thomas, boldly confessed your Son as Lord and God. With Jesus, our leader, empower us to live according to his ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your mercy, O God, in your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us stand together. Following his resurrection, the Lord Jesus breathed peace upon his disciples. We share in this peace of Christ in the church today. And so we say, the peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share God's peace with one another. Y'all, y'all, <clears throat> y'all got to remember the the pandemic's over. You got to stand up. <clears throat> Let us pray. 
Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered as one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray now as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please know that we practice open communion here. If you are a communing member of your home church or you feel led to commune with us today, you are more than welcome. The risen Christ dwells with us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. Those of you who are communing at home, receive the elements with these words. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may be seated. <clears throat>
of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink of his blood, and drink of his blood. You shall not have life within you, and I will raise you up, and I will raise you up, and I will raise you up. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Now receive this benediction for the week to come. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending song is Celebrate Jesus. Thank you.